Today on Beers TV Investigates, Cato Morpha, Totally Worthless, or Maybe the Ideal Tank Filter. Hi, I'm Ryan, your host of BRS TV Investigates, a weekly YouTube series which explores popular reefing theories, products, methods, what the manuals are missing with a focus on putting them to the test. For the past month, we've been testing if Cato Morpha has the ability to make an impactful reduction in the nutrients in a reef tank. This question has been debated for as long as I can remember, and the general feeling ranges from it's almost completely worthless and a waste of time or effort, all the way to this is the only filter I need on my tank. So today's BRS TV Investigates is, are catomorpha based refugiums effective as a primary source of nutrient reduction? I'd say the general thought in the reefing community seems to be that it reduces some nutrients, but not particularly effective in most cases unless the fuge is absolutely gigantic. Maybe 20 to 50% of the water volume in your tank or larger. On top of that, very few reefers believe that this type of refugium is capable of keeping nutrients near ultra low levels. Many reefers would like to keep them at like 0.03 parts per million phosphate or zero to a few parts per million nitrate. I think this is a pretty important topic for reefers because if it works, it's potentially a very low cost method of maintaining low nutrients in the tank using a very natural and fairly balanced method, meaning that both phosphate and nitrate are controlled using the same method. It also likely won't strip them to complete zero, which is unhealthy, adds all kinds of beneficial microfauna to the tank, and many people believe that the algae even releases some beneficial proteins, carbohydrates, and other metabolites into the tank the corals can utilize for growth and health. If it doesn't work, everyone can stop wasting their time and effort messing around with this nonsense. It takes up a ton of space and requires some amount of work monitoring and harvesting the algae. Today this is going to be a four week update and not the complete results. Watching the initial results so far, it's pretty clear that most of you are going to want to see long term six months or more results because what we've seen so far challenges some common thought and there are a lot of different angles to look at this from. That said, I don't think anyone wants to wait that long to see the results. It'll be fun for the reefing community to follow along with the story as it progresses because there's certainly been some really interesting results so far. To begin with, we'll share how we set up the test, which at a basic level is just a 25 gallon tank with 300 grams of catomorph in it. We added a heater set to 78 degrees, a Cobalt Aquatics MJ1200 for flow, and an air-driven sponge filter. The air-driven sponge filter serves two purposes. One is to help cycle the tank, and the other is to promote gas exchange. CO2 can be a significant limiting factor with algae growth, and we wanted a more closely simulated reef tank, which has tremendous gas exchange with high flow and surface tension braking on the tank and equipment like protein skimmers. We also selected four different light sources, a standard 65K 23 watt or 100 watt equivalent compact fluorescent bulb from the hardware store with an inexpensive clip on reflector, a 19 watt PAR 38 LED refugium bulb, a Kessel H380 horticulture lamp set to growth spectrum, and a hang on aquafuge with their accessory 7 watt LED strip. We also have one system set up as a control which has no LG or light. To provide nutrients, we looked at a lot of different options from liquid fish meal to frozen foods, pellets, or even dosing known amounts of ammonia and phosphate. In the end, we felt the best option was to use a food or nutrient source which could be referenced against a typical action in a reef tank by adding a single cube of frozen mysis each day so you can get an idea of how all this works against one of the more popular food options out there and in a standard or scalable quantity. Since there's no food in the tank, we elected to blend the cube with tank water prior to addition, which will help break it down into phosphate and components of nitrogen like ammonia and resulting nitrate much quicker rather than just rotting at the bottom of the tank. I'd also note that we only add food on weekdays, so there's only five cubes a week of food added to the tank. So what you're about to see today is a net effect of adding 20 cubes of food over four weeks to an uncycled tank with fresh salt water. One note I'd like to make abundantly clear is in the control tank, this volume of food in an uncycled tank has made the cycle take much longer than it normally would, and the tank is still experiencing significant bacterial blooms. I think it might be a few more weeks before we see a stable cycle in the control. For that reason, today our primary focus will be on phosphate levels and the associated reduction which is not as heavily impacted by the biological processes of the nitrogen cycle and the time it takes for that to complete. Phosphate in general just has fewer interferences and is easier to interpret. I'm going to share the nitrate levels, but I don't believe that they're representative of the total amount of nitrate we're going to see once the cycle is complete, and I fully expect it to jump rather rapidly once the bacteria population stabilizes and the bloom alleviates itself. 
I'm going to start by sharing the levels in the control tank and then work our way through the other tanks or light sources based on increasing expectations of effectiveness. Over four weeks, you can see the nitrate level in the control tank has gone up and down but ended at about 2.5 parts per million, which at face value isn't significant to most reefers. Ultimately, I think the 20 cubes of food will result in higher nitrate levels than we're seeing here. Again, I wouldn't spend too much time thinking about the nitrate numbers and we'll get a better picture into nitrate over the next month or two. However, the phosphate has seen fairly consistent increases from week to week. It's matching expectations and increasing by 0.4 to 0.5 parts per million a week. And after four weeks resting at 1.46 parts per million, which is more than I bet a lot of people expected to see. Keep in mind there's no fish or cleanup crew to eat the food and uptake some portion of the phosphate. No skimmers, filter socks, or other filtration, and no corals as well. This is just a net effect of a single cube of food absent of any other external factors which are normally happening in a reef tank. So let's take a look at the hang-on fuge, which most reefers feel like is too small to be effective. Again, you'll see the nitrate fluctuate a bit, but resting at 1.3 parts per million, which is about half of the control. With the phosphate, we've seen a pretty significant reduction over the controls, 1.46 parts per million, and after four weeks, we're seeing just 0.3 parts per million, which is less than a fourth of the total phosphate in the tank. So I think the initial results in this case are showing that the hang-on fuge and associated light source are not stripping out all of the nutrients, but there does seem to be a pretty significant reduction. And for the average reefer, that could mean less dependence on other filtration and likely even less reliance on maintenance like water changes to reduce those nutrients. It's even possible that once you consider other export methods like the skimmers and biological uptake by fish and the cleanup crew, you might see pretty darn low levels. Overall, better performance than many would have anticipated for a hang-on fuge, and I think we'll all be excited to see longer-term, two, three, or even four-month results. I will note that the light seems to be pretty white, not the best spectrum for algae growth, but it is convenient considering the shape of the fuge. We might get better performance with a different light source. I'd also note that there's already what I reference as a pretty astounding amount of microfauna growing in the fuge. So for those of you that are doing it for that reason, and to maintain fish like mandarins, there's no question that it's generating a pretty impressive amount of pods and other life for only four weeks of being up. Moving on to the $5 hardware store, compact fluorescent with the clip-on reflector. Visually, it hasn't grown a whole lot, but so far the nutrient reduction has been pretty stunning. Nitrate has gone up and down a bit, but currently at just one part per million. However, the phosphate levels are just 0.1 parts per million, which is pretty darn low for 20 cubes of food and no other export methods or biological uptake. This $5 bulb could potentially be one of the most cost-effective nutrient export methods in the hobby if this stays true for a series of months. Really not quite as low as some people would like to keep their levels, but this bulb outperformed my expectations for sure. One notable observation is visually it hasn't grown a whole lot, so the mass is likely just becoming more nutrient dense. The mass is certainly much darker green than some of the more rapidly growing masses. I think the density, color, and overall growth will be pretty interesting to compare against nutrient reduction results over time. Moving on to the 19 watt LED PAR 38 bulb. This is certainly brighter than the fluorescent bulb we just tested and marketed it as a spectrum which is good for refugium growth, but $80 rather than five. This is where you can start to see some pretty impressive results. Again, nitrate fluctuating a bit, but this week only 0.7 parts per million, which is a fraction of the control and in a range that most reefers would be very happy with. However, the phosphate has been consistently low from the beginning at near zero, and this week 0.03, which is smack dab right on the goal most reefers have for phosphate. Most importantly, it isn't gradually increasing to any significant degree, which means this level might be sustainable. While the overall effectiveness might be surprising to many of us, I don't think anyone will be surprised that the LED is outperforming the compact fluorescent bulb because it provides much higher PAR levels. PAR or light is the number one driver of plant growth and the related uptake in nutrients, so common sense strongly suggested that it would perform better. In fact, in this case, you can see the algae mass has also grown pretty substantially, at least doubled in size. Moving on to the $300 90-watt Kessel H380 LED, which was specifically designed for horticulture and plant growth and used for that purpose in pretty high-demand industries. We've seen sustainable low nitrate from the beginning and currently at 0.75 parts per million, which again, where most reefers would consider really low. Not surprisingly, the phosphate has also been pretty sustainably low from the beginning, and this week at a pretty incredible 0.02 parts per million, which is right under the goal most reefers have. In this case, the algae mass is rapidly expanding in several times its original size. It's very obviously growing rapidly, so it comes no surprise that the nutrients are accordingly low. 
Just for one additional data point, I took a pH measurement on each tank during the middle of the lighting cycle, which could give us a window into the amount of carbon dioxide in the tank and potentially a window into the rate of photosynthesis each light is producing. Lower pH levels are generally closely tied to high levels of carbon dioxide and related carbonic acid in the tank. Since the algae uptakes carbon dioxide as a component of photosynthesis, a higher pH likely means the carbon dioxide is being consumed by the algae faster than the gas exchange from the bubbler or breaking surface tension can replace it. The control tank with no light had a pH of 8.09, which is probably around what most people would expect for a tank of water with good gas exchange. The hang-on fuge had a pH of 8.05, which is not that much different than the control. It's hard to guess why it might be slightly lower, but maybe the gas exchange isn't quite as good. The compact fluorescent bulb had a pH of 8.14, which is slightly higher than the controls, indicating somewhat lower carbon dioxide levels, but nothing major. However, the PAR38 bulb had a pH of 8.24, which is significantly above the control, and a strong indicator that carbon dioxide is being consumed by photosynthesis faster than it can be replaced by gas exchange. This matches the desired effect that most reefers are hoping for by lighting their refugium at night. However, when we get to the Castle H380, the pH is a pretty ridiculous 8.75, which to me is a pretty strong indicator of low CO2, and the high PAR levels are promoting rapid photosynthesis. This pH data doesn't definitively prove photosynthesis rates, but there's a very strong correlation between pH, CO2, and photosynthesis, and it matches general expectations, so I certainly think it's worth considering. Particularly for those of you that are using the refugium as a primary method of stabilizing daily pH swings by lighting the fuge at night to consume CO2. Certainly it would seem that higher PAR bulbs or bulbs with more photosynthetic active radiation will be beneficial to achieving that goal. In relation to that, I think it's pretty likely that with both the PAR38 and the Kessel H380, lighting isn't the limiting factor for the algae masses in this test growth, and the availability of nitrate and phosphate are the limiting factors, which is a strong indicator that the fuge is working by design. I think as this test progresses, we're going to put that to the test by increasing the amount of food added to the tank. So I think the initial results on all the lights and implementations are pretty darn positive. It's way too early for us to suggest that everyone go out and implement a refugium. And I'm not prepared to make a claim on today's question of are catomorpha-based refugiums effective as a primary source of nutrient reduction? But I do think it's a good point to start evolving the conversation and discussing what goes into an effective refugium implementation as the test goes on. For instance, getting beyond the blanket statement of you need a fuge 20 to 50 percent of the size of your display tank size, which likely isn't accurate in a rather large range regardless, the thought process of only discussing fuge size in relation to tank size is inherently flawed, and I think we can help each other out better by understanding the fundamental goals here. A more accurate way to consider how to design and implement your fuge is to consider three main elements. The amount of nutrients you need to reduce, the impact increasing PAR, which increases the rate of photosynthesis has on all this, and the amount of contact time needed to achieve your low nutrient goals. The first component of that is the amount of algae that you need to grow closely corresponds to your feeding habits. For example, someone with a 40-gallon tank and someone with a 120-gallon tank might both feed a single cube of frozen food daily, which is the same amount of nutrients, and the person with a 120-gallon tank doesn't necessarily need a fuge three times the size as the reefer with a 40-gallon tank, or three times as much algae to be as effective at removing the same amount of nutrients. In fact, that doesn't make any sense at all, so consider your feeding habits. If you're a stingy feeder, you can get away with a lower performance fuge than someone who dumps in a fistful of food three times a day. The second element is the strength of the light source and the impact that has on increasing the rate of photosynthesis within the algae. If you have a high performance light source, which is producing double or triple the rate of photosynthesis of a hardware store light, you can likely get away with a much smaller fuge because the smaller volume of algae you're maintaining is effectively working harder. The reverse is also likely true. If you have plenty of space, a large fuge with multiple low-cost light sources might be the most cost-effective solution. However, if you want an effective fuge in a small space like under your stand, increasing PAR and related photosynthesis rates might be the most effective approach. Third, you also need to consider contact time, keeping in mind we're essentially trying to outcompete the algae and other unwanted nutrient-based pests which are or could potentially start growing in the display tank. This is where the volume does matter in most common implementations. If the fuge is 10% of the tank size, 90% of the time the water is in the display. This makes it more difficult to make sure the nutrient reduction is happening in the fuge and not in the display. 
However, if you up the fuge to 50% of the tank size, the water and the nutrients it contains are in the fuge in contact with the algae a third of the time. With common tank turnover rates, it's very likely that the contact time is sufficient that the fuge is actively removing a significant amount of the nutrients versus what's happening in the display tank. In relation to that, keep the PAR levels in your display tank versus refugium in mind. If you want a $5 hardware store bulb to outcompete the photosynthesis rates produced by your $1,000 reef tank lights in the display, you're going to have to have a pretty large fuge with a considerable amount of algae and a whole lot of contact time. If you put the same level of effort into lighting the fuge as you do your display tank and effectively increase the rate of photosynthesis in your fuge, the contact time, the amount of algae required to outcompete the display tank will almost certainly decrease as well, so the fuge doesn't have to be as large. A few last notes, we did run into some challenges along the way that I'd like to share. First is with the H380, we actually ran into some significant hair algae issues. It's likely not that the light itself promotes hair algae, just that the 90 watt LED produces so much PAR or photosynthetic energy in the plant growth spectrum that it will promote rapid growth of any algae. With our first attempt at this test, the hair algae exploded so fast that we had to cancel the test and start over. This time when we saw the first signs of hair algae, we cleaned it off the glass and pumps, but left it in the tank so it didn't export any nutrients. Around week two, we saw some pretty large chunks growing, so we did remove it, but we blended it all up and poured it back into the tank, so the nutrients stayed in the tank. The following week, the hair algae was no longer an issue and hasn't been since. I strongly believe this is because the catomorph is now outcompeting the hair algae for nutrients in the tank, and the hair algae doesn't have a chance to take hold when the phosphate is at 0.02 parts per million and the nitrate below one part per million, which would indicate this is all working by design. The fuge is not just functioning at reducing nutrients, but also preventing undesirable algae outbreaks. The nitrogen cycle is also a bit less predictable than we anticipated. I wish we had put some senis in the tanks to track the ammonia levels throughout the process. We did consider pre-cycling the tanks or using some instant cycle products, but these were variables we didn't want to introduce at the time. In the end, it will just take a bit longer to get stable nitrate results. Related to that, we also found low-level nitrate testing to be a bit less reliable than we'd like. We made seawater reference solutions using Hawk standards, tested a variety of test kits as well as our Hawk DR900, and the DR900 was able to produce the best results across the widest range. However, we want to be able to produce the best results we can for you, so we upped the game this week and picked up a $4,300 benchtop DR3900 spectrophotometer, which has a higher degree of accuracy for all the tests we performed for the reefing community. I think this was a good investment, and we're always excited about upping the game. Thank you for being interested in enough in all this that we get to pick up these fun toys. So where do we go from here? Well, I think we'll let the current test run another couple of months and see if the trends continue and if the results are sustainable. After that, I think it might be fun to up the game and call the LG back down to 300 gram samples again and start over with two or even three cubes of food and really get to the bottom of if light is a significant limiting factor and if higher par lights do effectively remove more nutrients. I know all of you have some questions on this one, and I sure hope some of you are as interested in this as we are. So share your thoughts on this on our Reef to Reef thread, because it's your chance to direct where this test goes in the future, and potentially even address any ways that you might have to improve the accuracy of results. As always, if you like what we're doing here, give us a quick thumbs up because it means a lot to us to know that you enjoy these videos and subscribe so you don't miss next week's where we test a variety of heaters, not just for accuracy, but how large the on and off cycle variance is. See you next week with another BRS TV Investigates.